Greetings, and welcome to another installment from the Patchwork Productions Learn to Crochet for Beginners series. In this video, you will learn how to make a crochet hook case. For those of you who are new to my channel, my name is Stitch, and Patchwork Productions is all about learning and doing crochet. So make sure you subscribe so you never miss another installment. Without further ado, let's get started. So for this video, we're going to be making something quite practical and quite versatile for the individual who decides to make this, uh, because we shall be making a crochet tool holder. That doesn't sound too fancy. But basically, we'll be making a little casing to hold out all of our crochet hooks, crochet needles, or anything else that you might want to put inside uh, the casing, like, for example, these stitch markers that I have here, these little clip thingies that I could put in a little pouch in the case. So what's nice about this pattern, the way I'll be showing you how to make it, is that you can make it to whatever uh, dimensions you want just using the general idea of how you make it. So there won't necessarily be an exact amount of stitches and rows to make it for it for um, to, to, to make the, the case. But if anyone is interested in making it the exact way I did it or using the same gauge, I'll provide all of that information at the end. Um, or in the description box so that you can use the exact um, gauge and dimensions that I used for mine. I'm going to be making mine for what I have, but you can make yours for whatever you want. So basically the idea is that as a crocheter, sometimes, at least for me, I, I can get a little messy. So I have a lot of hooks and I used to just store them in this Ziploc bag, which isn't too, you know, nice. And while they do sell nice, nice cases for crochet hooks to keep all of your stuff organized, that's what they call them, organizers. Anywho, um, I decided, hey, I might as well make myself one. So I thought it'd be fun to do that. And in addition to making them for my hooks, I decided I could try to make them to fit all the rest of my stuff, like my needles and anything else. So basically, the way I'm going about doing this is that there's going to be an outer case, which I've chosen to do in this gray. By the way, feel free to use whatever colors you'd like. Um, but this gray will just be on the outside, so it's like a book. So you have the book cover, and then you have all the pages in between. So this is the book cover. And then I'll have the little sheets in there, I guess I'll call them. But the little sections that will hold my hooks, which I've chosen to do in a lighter gray. Again, you can use whatever color you'd like. Now, I happen to have a lot of hooks, but someone might not have as many hooks as I do. Um, so because I have a lot of hooks, I'm going to be making several of these pages to fit in my, in my little cover. So I'm going to probably have if I estimate right, three, maybe four. I'll probably leave a space for four, but I'll only make three. We'll see. Um, but that's to hold all of my hooks and have a little extra space for the needles and anything else. So what I've done here is I have a ruler and a pencil and some grid paper. Now, grid paper is very, very valuable to a crocheter. Uh, and when we get to like color graphing and stuff for designing larger, more elaborate pieces of crocheted work, uh, graph paper is very, very useful. But in this case, it has a simpler use, which allows me to measure how large my, uh, my outer cover and my sheet needs to be, the in inlay sheet. So this is the graph I've sketched out for the inlay sheet. On my graph paper, each square is a quarter of an inch. If I got that correct, yes, it is a quarter of an inch square. And so what I decided to do was, let me just take my hook here. I did it that every single half an inch was just a space, and the hook would be somewhere in a, the quarter inch space. So it was going to be always a hook within a quarter inch space, a quarter inch space dividing each hook and then like such and for my uh let me take this one for my set here i have about eight hooks 
and so eight hooks would give me four inches, but it is always a wise idea to add extra because your sheet, you're not gonna have something right at the edge. So what I did instead was I made this five inches. So what you would do if you were doing this for yourself is you would count how many of the hooks you have and if you have grid paper, it makes it easier to line them out on it. Um, but you, you line them up. And as I, again, I've done it this way. If you feel like that would be too little space, um, you can add more. I was kind of trying to save space, plus I don't mind too much. But I've done it that there's a quarter inch space for each hook, and then there's a quarter inch space in between each hook. So that's a half inch total per hook. And after you count how many hooks you have, you can lay them out of course probably in order of size but it's not going to matter too much in the model that we're making here and you'll find out how many inches you're going to need and then you're basically going to add an extra inch so in this case because I have eight hooks that would be four inches because each hook would be allocated a uh, half an inch and then we would have four inches plus one, that's five inches. So I've gone with a five inch width. And basically all of my hooks that I'll be making for this case are um, roughly six inches long. And so the total height of my case, I will do seven inches. Again, adding an extra inch. We always wanna add a little extra than what we're going to be storing. So that's what I've done, and because all of my hooks are the same size in the sort of a way, that's what I'm doing. There is one exception, which is an important exception for you to consider, which is my largest, thickest, whatever you want to call it, -ist hook um, that I have, this plastic hook, which is a P16 or 11.5 millimeter hook. So this one can't fit in the quarter inch space. So it is going to be special and get an entire half inch um, dedicated to it, but it will still have a quarter inch in between it and the next hook um, on either side. In this case, I'm not going to have anything on this side, but if I did have anything on, on the other side of it, then it would still be a quarter of an inch space, but it's not going to be given just a quarter inch because it's too large. So if you're doing this and you have any um, hooks that are, you know, larger than normal, you will want to take that into account into your little uh, model here. So also, there will be two hooks that I own that I will not be putting in this case because they are by far too large. I have this one, which is my Q16 or a 16 millimeter um, hook. And this one is just too long and too too thick. So I won't be putting this one in there. Um, and then I also have this Afghan hook, which is large. It's an I-19, but it's an Afghan hook, so it's just long. I won't be putting that in there either. If you wanted to make a case for your hooks of those sizes, you could do that, but this will just be focusing on smaller size hooks and tools. So now that I have this down, I'll know how large my cover is going to be because this is the inside sheet. The cover just needs to be slightly larger than the sheet. So basically, if this is five inches, my larger cover would be roughly five and a half. And if this is seven inches, my larger cover will be seven and a half inches. So this is basically the way that you can know exactly how large your uh, project is going to be and, and how many stitches you need to make. So this is very customizable because not every crocheter stitches the same. So if you have a looser stitch, a larger stitch, a tighter stitch, you're using a different size hook, you can know exactly how many you're going to do because you can make your own little swatch to know, okay, when I crochet single crochets um, with this hook and this yarn, how large are they? And then you can apply that swatch to the dimensions that you have here. So let's say you get to every two inches you have 
10 stitches, let's just say. That means that you know that if your thing here is 5 inches, you're going to have 10, 20, and then 25 stitches. Just as, just as an example, because you know exactly how large it is. And if you know that you have two rows to, to an inch or something, I don't know, if you're using a jumbo yarn or something like that, you'll know that in seven, seven uh, inches, it would be 14 rows or something like that. Just, just as random examples to give you the idea that you can make this to whatever you want. But again, if anyone's interested, I will let you know what I use. I do know for my stitches, I'm going to be using, and if I can locate it, uh, here we go. I'm going to be using a um, H hook, H8 or five millimeter hook. So for me, using a five millimeter hook on this yarn, which is just a weight four yarn, um, my stitches are about a quarter inch. As for the rows, uh, I'm not too certain on what that is, so I'll have to figure that out. But basically, for the inside sheets, it's very simple. You're just making a single crochet uh, rectangle with the, um, with the dimensions given. It's very simple. Um, for the outside cover, it's a little different. So what I'll do is, as I get to different portions where the difference is, um, I'll cut the video there and be able to show you what I do. But just as a reference, what I'm going to be doing is my cover, as I get to what would be the size of the square that's just larger than the, the sheet that I'll be working with, I'm going to add just a couple extra, um, I'm going to add just a couple extra rows so that I can have a, a little binding place, a, a seam that I can work with to fold over my sheets. So it's not just like a little sandwich, but it's more like, um, more like, oh, like hardcover books, how they have that the way the cover comes around more rectangularly and not like those little pamphlety books that just have the staples that make a little pointy wedge at the end. So I'll show you how I do that when I get to that portion. So for right now, I'll begin making my cover and to make my life easy, I'm going to be making it starting from this edge. So this is going to be the, the edge that I start with and grow my rows in this way, in this direction. So I'll catch up with you as I get to different portions. So I finished uh, one piece of the, the back cover, the, the cover for this case, and I jotted down a couple of things that I did along the way so that I could tell you guys. Uh, first of all, I ended up doing a foundation chain of 31 uh, stitches so that that one extra stitch would be or chain I should say so that that one chain would be my turning chain and I have uh, 30 stitches going across my row and of course I started on this side of the of the project and so and so after I did that um, I went up 24 uh, rows here because my rows are not quite um, a quarter of an inch it's like it was like slightly less so I'm stitching a little tight um, if I stitched a tad looser my each of my rows would have been basically um, a quarter of an inch high as well um, so I did that and of course the back panel is going to be slightly larger than my uh, inner flap size. So this is the dimensions I, I sketched out for the inner piece that's going to be in the little booklet if you could call it. And this is going to be slightly larger which is why I've done it um, 34, um, 30 s stitches across. And then 24 is also because not only do I need to make the height of that, but I needed just a little extra in order to have my um, extra size on, on the ends. Because what happens is, instead of making it like this, I'm making it like this. 
and it's all going to be one piece. So I have to have my extra row on this side as well, and then have the, the rest of it. So what I then did after I've done that, after I did the, the 24 rows, is I made the binding, if you would call it, the little square square piece that's going to make this flat side of the book and then the other cover will come on top and what I did for this was I uh, I guess you could say I cheated <laughs> I used the slip stitch in order to add a bend to my entire work remember in my slip stitch video I explained that slip stitches tend to lean to one side. This top row that I've done here, if you can see, is done um, with slip stitches. And you can see that the stitches are not sitting directly on top of the row. Instead, they are sitting on the side of the row. And I'm taking advantage of this down here as well. Um, I kind of worked this just so I could have it, but this will be the beginning for me, the beginning of the second other um, back flap. So I will have the same effect of me being able to work straight across. But basically, because it's leaning to that side, when I go back and work single crochets into it, this is what it could be, just a flat sheet, but it still has that little ridge in it that I can now uh, utilize to add a corner to my project. So it's a little shorthand trick that I like where I can use slip stitches to change angles. So I did a, a row of slip stitches, then I did a row of single crochets, and then I did a row of single crochets, but in the back loop only. And what this did for me was it gave me um, these ridges that you see here, these free loops that I'm going to utilize to join my uh, my flaps on the inside of my of my um, case. That's what I'm going to use to join the flaps to. I'm going to use those free loops. So the next row, because we would have turned our work, I did um, the next row as single crochets, but in the front loop only, so that all of my loops are on the same side. Now these are harder to see. Uh, you can see here, this is the back loop only row, so you can see the free loops here. This right here is the front loop only row, and the free loops are a little harder to see, but they are indeed there. If Let me just pull one up so you can see. This right here, if I can actually get under it, there we go. This right here is one of those free loops from the front loop only row. So I worked that, and then I worked one more row of back loop only. So I have three sets of, of free loops available in those rows. Then I worked a single crochet row, and then another slip stitch row, which is the row that you see here. And now what I would do is I would make 24 more rows so I get my other side and I will have my entire book um, cover. So this is how you can work yours, uh, whatever you're doing for yours. The little spine, if you want to call it, can just be worked uh, by doing a row of slip stitches and then working back into those slip stitches to add a corner uh, to your work. Because if you if you can see this this spine here, this is the slip stitch, and then on the on the inside it makes this crease, and that's the same effect that we're gonna get here. Um, because I'm going to work back into those and it's going to come at the angle that those slip stitches are at and we can utilize that and then you can do front loop back loop alternating so that you could get um, these free loops to be able to join your sheets into when you're making the rest of your of your case so I'll go ahead and finish this and then we can show you how to make the actual inner flaps for for your case All right, so, ta-da! This is what the cover looks like when it is finished. So like I said before, I did another 24 uh, rows on this side so I could complete the other flap. And uh, I also did a slip stitch 
border around the edge just to make a simple simple border so it's nothing nothing extravagant and of course it does kind of look flat but because I did those uh, slip stitches right on these two rows for the binding piece I can fold it just like this and here I have my cover so now we can actually work on what goes inside of this cover which I already went ahead and did all three of mine just so I could show you guys a couple of different things and I'll show you how to do them um, and I have to say when I finished making each and every one of them I was so happy and you will be too so here's one this is the first one I made here is the second one I made here's the third one I made and yes I've accumulated quite a lot of hooks but this will be definitely a really great way of keeping all of my hooks organized so what I'll say first of all is as far as measurements and swatching stuff goes because this is the size of my inside square and I was using a H sized hook or a five millimeter hook I tried to do the best I could but I simply did stitch for stitch block for block so every single cube I have here I made a stitch for it and it was roughly the measurements I needed I mean give or take just a little for a swatch you don't really need to be as precise with me as you would need to be with your own project um, but if you wanted to each of my stitches roughly made that quarter inch that would be needed to, to make the full distance because each of these squares is about a quarter inch and my rows were roughly a quarter inch. On some of them, just because of the way they are, they do misshape so you have to stretch them like this so that their sides narrow to the right shape and their length stretches to the right length. Um, it just happens because of how the, the the way I have it works, which I'll explain shortly. But it's not too big a deal to be worried about the exact um, the exact swatch dimensions as long as it can fit your case that you made. Or if you're making my case, if you have the same stitch style, it'll most likely you know fit unless you did a different stitch size for this. Like you stitch this one tighter, but this one looser. Yeah, you'll get something different. Anywho, so if you want to know, just as a reference, as far as raw stitches go, basically for the inside sheets, this is, um, I think it's uh, 24. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Oh, my bad, 20. And then this would be 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 6. Oh, this is 28. Yeah, I remember now. So this is 20 by 28. So basically, as far as your foundation row would go, and because we're working in single crochets, you'd make a foundation row of 29 chains, because that 29th chain would be your turning chain. Um, and then your rows, you would do 28 rows. So that's what I have here. Now here's where the fun stuff comes in. To make this, of course for the cover, we worked it this direction, um, just so that we could get that binding on this side, because if we worked it up, we would have to work the binding with it. That would just be awkward. Um, plus, as far as orientation goes, it would be better to have the binding like this instead of like that. Anywho's, these, on the other hand, we work from the bottom up because of how the loops have to go. So as you can see here, these loops hold onto the hooks. This is how it's designed. So I'm going to show you how to do that, but what you first want to do is you want to take whatever set of hooks you have and you want to put them on your grid to see where they'll fit. Because you're doing this, or at least because I'm doing this um, stitch to block one to one ratio, um, wherever I fit this, is where I need to make my loops and and um, and where I need to not make loops. So of course, as you can see here, I didn't do loops everywhere. I just did them in certain places. In the first one, I think I made too many loops. So I have one, two, three, four, five loops. And I was like, well, maybe I don't need that much. So on this one, I did one, two, three, four, which I was like, hmm, let me try one less. And then we get this one, one, two, three. Um, so what you have to do is you have to put it here and see where you need to start making loops 
and you know all that sort of stuff. So because I'm doing one to one ratio of stitch to blocks, I have two blocks high here, two little grid sections. And so this would be two rows that I work in single crochets that don't have any loops. In here is where I might make a loop, depending on where I decide to put it. And then up top here are two rows where I don't have any um, any hook, you know, where it is. So I wouldn't put any loops there. And that's what I did. Top two loops, uh, top two rows here, no loops. Bottom two rows here, no loops. Um, that's how I've done it. Now, I eventually moved where I put loops later, um, but those will definitely never have loops. So you got to align that. Next thing you need to align is how many hooks you have. So what I ended up doing, let me just um, take these out for a second. What I ended up doing was taking all of my hooks and just lining them up on here so that I could see see if I can get these roughly how I did it so I could see where I would need to um, in my stitch count where I would need to have loops and not have loops so you this you want to do the same thing for yours or if you're doing what I'm doing this is what you would do you just want to line them up and see which one of these grid columns is a hook in and which one is not because wherever there's a hook you're going to want to put um, a loop there in your pattern and wherever there's not you just want to do a regular single crochet and so that's what I ended up doing now I have some large hooks here this is the one for the plastic and this is a large hook for the metal so for what I did on mine is this side is always going to just be one large loop um, so and then I put this as close to the edge as possible, which I can't actually remember the exact amount of stitches I left on either side. But what I believe I did was left two columns, um, which would be these last two stitches if you're working this way. I left these two open and I had my hook here. And then on this side, I think I just had one column which would be the first stitch open so let me just quickly put these in their respective columns so that hopefully I can show you here what I ended up doing so this is what I ended up with this column right here got an extra large loop this column here didn't get any and then wherever we see um, spaces is just a single crochet and wherever we see a hook if we were in a row where we were putting loops because you can see not every row has loops it's less these rows and that row and this row these rows are just single crochets so wherever there was a row where we had loops there on a hook places where loops would go. Um, so this is something you want to map out so that you know where your loops want to be or like where you want your loops to be. So now that you have all that figured out, you can basically just begin crocheting. Now I will show you that I had three different ways of making my loops. Uh, technically four. One of them was consistent throughout all of them. For the last four of my or I should say for the four smallest sized hooks that I have which are a D and E and F and a G I always simply did um, a back loop single crochet so that the front loop was left as a free loop and that's what I put these through every single on all of them that's how they all are um, and I did that just because I felt it would hold them better because they're so small I felt like you know, they might be able to slide out. Turns out later that it's not too bad. I didn't need to, but I like it this way. If you want, I'll show you some other ways of doing it. But for these small ones, I always just did a back loop single crochet. Also, I should mention, I always did my, um, my loops on an odd numbered row. So a row that's going in this direction. Um, because... 
that means I could always only do back loop and I wouldn't have to remember, oh yeah, now I have to do a front loop single crochet so that the back loops, the free loop on the right side that I'm working with, uh, none of that thinking. All I do is on an odd numbered row, I always do the, um, the loop making so that whenever I get to this part, it's always just back loop single crochet. Um, as far as these loops, they are simply chains, but how I did them, well, yeah. So let me um, quickly make a uh, a little row here that I can make for, that I can um, demonstrate how I do my loops that you can see. So here I have a mini... Uh, row here. This is 10 stitches and I have two rows and so I'll basically, which is half of this, uh, but basically I'll just do this as if I was doing the full thing, of course shorter, so I can demonstrate the full process because I'm going to explain some stuff about the back loops and I'm going to explain some stuff about um, the, the chain loops. So the first way that I did the chains, which was this method, which I will actually preface this by saying it's the least advised method that I'm going to tell you. I don't advise it as much. I, I only found that out after I had done it. Um, but it, it goes like this. Basically, you're going to, of course, that first row column is going to be a single crochet. So we're going to make that single crochet. And then here's where the loop comes in. So ha, huh, let's see if I actually remember how to do this. Basically, you're going to, yes, work into the next stitch with a single crochet. You're going to chain, and I'll do chain four, um, because it'll e be easier to see some of the problems and because that is the first loop set that I make. So we're going to chain four. One, two, three, four. And then we're going to work back into that one, that same stitch. So we worked two single crochets into that same stitch, and then we have this chain, uh, this chain four. So the next one is going to be just a single crochet, because that would be one of our spaces. And the next one, we're going to do a chain three. And so we're going to single crochet chain three, and then into that same stitch, we're going to do a single crochet. And so we're going to do a single crochet in the next stitch, because that's our space. In the next stitch, do a single crochet, and we're going to do a chain two. One, two, and then into that same stitch, single crochet. This is just for demonstration, so you can see I'm going to do our space. I'll do one back loop, and then I'll have two, two extra single crochets. So this one's going to be a back loop single crochet, so that that front loop becomes a free loop. And now in the next two, we're just going to do single crochet, single crochet. All right, so let the demonstration begin. What we're going to do here is you'll notice we have our loops that are kind of hanging out of nowhere and we're going to need to change that. But what I'll mention first is that back loop single crochet that you made. It can be a little difficult to find the free loop. If you look here, I'm sure you can hardly see where that free loop is. It happens to be right there, but it can be difficult to see. And if you find it difficult when you come back to it to be like, where's that free loop? Because then you got to put your hooks in there. You can just, after you make the free loop, just find it because you you just did it so you know where it is and just pull nice and hard on it because it's going to cinch that back stitch that you made which isn't a real deal because once you stretch it it'll loosen up again but it'll be open it'll be loose and so now it'll be a whole lot easier uh to see because the loop is is there so that's the one thing i'll mention with the back loop um single crochet for your loops now for these, they're not done. To finish a loop section or row, you actually have to do another row on top. And this is the non-advised method. So for the first four 
is it? Yeah, for the first four single crochets on this even row, even numbered row, because that was row three we just did, it's just gonna be single crochets, because the back loop, you just work into it like a normal stitch. You don't do front loop, back loop, nothing. You just work into it normally. So you'll have that, that loop there, but the rest of it will be normal single crochets. Here's where the change comes. What I originally did for these loops is I did a, um, I did a two single crochet together. So those two single crochets that I made in that stitch before and after the however many number of chains I did, I joined those into one. So what you do is you insert it, draw a loop, you find the next single crochet, and you gotta be careful that you're not picking the wrong one. So uh, there's the next single crochet. And as you can see, I'm already having struggles because I've got to get my yarn around the right place. But I'm gonna draw that up, three loops on the hook, yarn over, draw through all three. And so that's how I did this method. And I'll just go ahead and finish the rest of them. Of course, the space is always just gonna be a single crochet. So that's easy. And then this next one is a two single crochet together. Uh, if I can get in there. So let me just finish this and then I'll show you the major, well, not quite major, but the big problem that you can have with this method. All right, so before I explain the problem, let me just do a little rundown of how this worked. You made, when we were working on r row three, we did, we worked into a stitch, the first stitch, just a single crochet. The next stitch, we worked into it with a single crochet, we chained four, and we worked back into that same stitch with a single crochet. And then we did a single crochet and did the same thing with the next stitch with three, single crochet, same thing in the next one with two, and we went on. As we are coming back, we joined the two single crochets from those loop stitches together. So we did a single crochet, chain of however many number, and a single crochet. We joined those two single crochets together, but we made sure the loop was on this side, because those are the loops we have to use. So we made sure the loops were to that side, and we joined them to one stitch. Reason is because we need the same number of stitches. We're always going to have 20 stitches that we're working into, but these chains are extras because we got to stick our loops into them. Here's where the problem comes. After you've done that, these loops are way harder to use because on this chain four, you can find the center because it's large enough. But even on the chain three, it's very hard to find where you stick that, that loop into. If you go from the back, it's a little easier. Um, once you get down to a chain two, it's almost impossible. I was thankfully able to do it, not too bad, but it still gives me a little grief. Um, and you definitely cannot do this with a chain one. It will be horrendous. Like, whatever you do, do not try this method with a chain one. Um, so this method, unless you're going to be doing chain fours and maybe chain threes, you can get away with it. Um, unless you're going to be doing th those two larger sizes, this isn't a recommended method for chain two and smaller, because it's just hard to work with. And if you're making a crochet hook case, you want to be able to, you know, move stuff nice and freely um, so that you can work with it. So that's the first method that I did. The second method, oh, so it is only three. Anywho, so the second method that I did, which I'll just make the next loop row right here, it's the same idea um, except how we go about doing the, the even row right behind that loop row is different. So what I'm actually going to do is uh, undo this row right here that I did and redo it, showing you the easier way. So let's just uh, pull this out carefully to right before this stitch, and there we go. So here is the other way to do this, which I definitely recommend. So remember, we have single crochet, chain, and single crochet. And I hope you can see what I'm doing here, so let's just uh, zoom this in a tad. Okay, hopefully you can see better now. So we have a single crochet, chain, single crochet. 
And instead of doing a two single crochet together, <laughs> what we're gonna do instead is simply carefully look and find the stitch that you worked the single crochets and the chain into. You're just gonna look carefully and make sure you can find them. And what you're gonna do is work into that stitch through the loop. So I'm gonna do this nice and slow. So you're gonna find the stitch, which is right here. You have a single crochet there, a chain two, single crochet there. So what you're gonna do is find this, insert it, find the middle of your loop, bring it back through. So now your loop is on the side it's supposed to be. You add that stitch and you're gonna work a single crochet right there. The next stitch is just gonna be a single crochet because that was your space. So we don't need to work any loopy stuff there. And now we're gonna do the same thing here. This is the chain three. So it's a lot easier to see the stitch and the chain hole. So we're gonna go right into there, right through the chain hole. So the chain's on the right side. This is the side it's supposed to be on. And we're in that stitch and we're just going to work a single crochet. Next is a single crochet because that's our space. And we're going to do the same thing. This is the chain four. It's really easy to see the, the chain hole. And then there's the stitch. So we're going to go into that, come up through that, and make our single crochet. Next one, of course, is going to be a single crochet. And then you're turning chain for moving on, but I'll just do it for the sake of turning. So this is going to be a whole lot easier. So let me just zoom out real quick. All right, so this one, this method right here is a lot easier. It's a little interesting because technically that section there is going to be shorter because you're not actually working on the stitches that were made um, on, the, on that row. You're kind of working below. It's a little tricky to explain, but the point is, as you can clearly see, the effects are not too terrible, but you may notice like when, when this is in its natural form, there is a slight dip on this side. I think you can clearly see that there is a dip. And there is a very valuable reason to this, which is, as I said, you're not actually working in the stitch of that row, you're working under it. You're working in the stitch that that row stitch was worked into. So you're working one stitch below. This will cause it to be shorter, um, but it's definitely easier and makes the loops a lot easier to utilize. Um, plus, a little stretch won't hurt it. And if you decide, you can block your work, which if you don't know how to block, I have a video on that. But you can just block your work. I would probably do a wet block, um, just soak it for 10 minutes. And then you can put into the shape it's supposed to be pretty much fine because this isn't something that's going to be worn. It's not too critical. So me personally, that's what I went with after this because believe me, fighting with this, not too fun. So this method makes your chains a whole lot easier to use. From the chain four to the chain two, you can find that hole right there, slip this in, and it is so easy to use. Plus, it's an alternative if you find the back loop single crochet, the free loop style for holding your smallest ones. If you find that tricky to work with, you can use um, a chain one with this method by working through the, the loop. You can do a chain one because it's not gonna get stuck. Um, you're not gonna have crazy problems. So if you find that the front loop is being a little tricky, um, or I should say the free loop. It's a back loop, single crochet with a front loop, free loop. Uh, if you find that to be tricky, you can just do this method and use a chain one instead of a chain two or whatever, and it will hold these hooks very fine. So that's what I would recommend. Here, I believe I did a chain one with that method right here, because um, that should be a chain two 
is it this one that I did it with or is it the other one? I think it's this one right here. Yep. And use, as you can see, it works perfectly. So that's basically how you go about making this. And where you place your, your uh, loops is up to you. I placed mine roughly around the five-ish, six-ish row mark for my first loop. Um, here, I did two loops, but you don't have to do two, but it's around the 13, 14, 15, 16 row mark. And then this top one was about, I think it was 25, 26, no, 24, 25. 23, 24, my bad. 23, 24. And I say two rows because remember, the first row makes the loops and the second row finishes the loops because without that second row, you just have these loose loops that are useless. So you always have to, uh, first, this, this odd numbered row always makes the loop and then the even numbered row makes the, the loops usable. That's why I say two loops. So that's where I placed it, frankly. This is sufficient, just doing one, two, three. So this would be at five, six. This would be at 13, 14. This would be at 23, 24. That is quite sufficient. But if you wanna add more, that's basically what you do. The rest of the rows will just be single crochets and you're fine. That's basically it. And you just build up. So what I did here while I was doing it was I jotted down, you probably can't read it, but I just jotted down where what each stitch in a row would be. So I have single crochet, chain four, single crochet, chain three, chain three, because I wanted to know the sizes. What I ended up doing was for the largest one, I always did chain four. For these um, first two, the next two largest ones I have, I did a chain three, next two, chain two, and the last four was a front loop or, or a, um, a free loop, back loop, single crochet. So that's what I did for these. So making your own can be very simple. You can get these done. And also last thing, if you want to make an addition to this, make it a little bit more functional, if we just turn this over, you can see that I have my yarn needles and some stitch markers that I have here hanging. So I can keep these all together. And the way I did this it's just as I was working, I just decided where and when. It was around this spot right here in the rows. I just did um, front loop or back loop, whichever one got the loop on the got the free loop on this side of the work because you don't want it on this side. You want it on this side. So if I'm working in this direction, it would have been a front loop single crochet that I did, which would get me a back loop um, free loop. And if I was working in this direction. I would have done a, um, which actually it would be flipped. So then if I'm working again in this direction, it would still be a front loop single crochet. No, it would be a back loop single crochet that I would do. So I get a front loop free loop, which means it would always remain on this side. And then this is something you can do as an addition to your just hook case to get some additional functionality. Also, if you wanted, you could do a pouch instead, which you just need to make a square of single crochets and join it to the back, and you'd have a pouch you could put stuff in. I, did, I decided I wasn't going to do that. So the last step in this project, which is, I'd actually say, probably one of the easier steps, is to now join this into here. So remember, we have our little spine with free loops. And what we're gonna do is simply join these into here by those free loops. Now here's the thing. When I finish these, I also put a slip stitch border around them. Um, so the slip stitch border that I did on this side, which is the side I planned on having on the inside, I did it so that it kind of thickened it. You see these, I kind of did it so it's more on top you probably can't see, but I did it so it's more on top, um, the slip stitches. On this side though, you see how it's all bulky and probably a little messy, and if it, this thing can focus, there we go. I did that so that I have, you know, more surface area to 
stitch to. So now what we're going to do is we're just going to find our free loops. This is one set of free loops. This is another set of free loops. It's a little harder to see. And this is the last set of free loops. And we can just join these in here. And of course, on mine, I did three of these, as I explained earlier. Um, I did three of these free loop rows because I only have three sheets. If you have one sheet, you could just do one free loop row. And if you have more, you can do more, which means your binding would be thicker. So I'll go ahead and join these so we can get to the conclusion of this uh, project here. So I'm on the last one. Figured I might as well show you how I do it. Um, but this is basically what it looks like using these bindings, the free loop edge. So uh, yeah, it's really great. Let me just do a quick little zoom in here. There you go. So now you can see what I'm doing here. So basically I'm doing a very simple join. It's just a whip stitch. So you need a, a yarn needle and so of course yarn. And uh, if you don't know what the whip stitch is, not only will I be showing you, but I do have a full tutorial on joining, um, which I will encourage you to check out. Should have it right up here, little link to it. Um, so basically you just find that free loop and you go two, uh, two loops down because the case is supposed to be theoretically larger than, um, than your sheets. But as with anything in crochet, over time it shrinks and takes on its natural shape. So it's not actually, um, it's not actually larger. Plus I did this a little tight. So sometimes it'll look like this one where it does not appear to be uh, larger. But if you just pull this a little and pull these to their right shape, it'll be fine. Again, if you wanna fix all these, if you wanna have it absolutely perfect, uh, number one, you could use an official swatch so that when everything's settled, it's where it's supposed to be. Um, or you can just block it and it'll be fine. But anywho, so you're gonna take this, and of course the edge that we're joining is this edge, because in my case, it's the edge that we slip stitched in this thick way, so it's kind of a firmer binding. And so you're gonna just insert it into that first section, if you can find it, if I can find it, there we go. And into Let's see exactly which one I did. Did I do the second one? I did the second one. So right into the second loop right there. We're going to insert it. Pull it through, pull it through, and then just make a simple knot back here so it doesn't pull all the way through. Um, just like that and tie it again. There we go. And then basically all you do is just follow your stitches down. Because the um, the stitches in this, in the cover, should be the same number as the rows that you have in this one. If you match them up one for one, you gotta look carefully, it'll fit flawlessly as you can see with these two. It'll just fit right in with the stitches one for one. Um, so you just gotta look to see where you put them and find them and then go to the next of your free loops and just do a whip stitch join. That simple. You find the next one, which in my case looks to be right around here. Go into the next stitch and pull it. So that's why we left those free loops because now we can use them to do a simple join and uh, join these sheets into our little cover. So I'll just make my conclusion now. Uh, at the end of this, if you want, you can, of uh, your, your own choice, you can weave in the, the stitches, the, the weave in the like ends from all your works to make it look a lot more neat and tidy. 
You can add a nicer border. Of course, we haven't really covered too many borders, but we will be covering more of them in the future. Um, but you can add more flaps. Of course, you would need to have a bigger cover for that because the way the binding is done, as you can see, it only supports as many flaps as it has free loops for. So in this case, I made sure I had three free loop rows because I was going to have three sheets to go inside of my case. But um, if you have more, you can do more. You can add a pouch to yours. Um, if you want to add other stuff, <laughs> frankly, you could add something on the inside of the cover because nothing's stopping you. Of course, this is fully customizable. And I know this was a kind of long tutorial, um, a lot to digest, but if you're having trouble, just go back through and watch it. This tutorial isn't quite a pattern. It's more of a fully customizable um, project that you can do with some ideas, and then you can take those ideas and turn them into what you want. And even if it was a little hard to follow, if you do exactly what I did, which I, I hope I gave enough um, details on what I did for mine, you should be able to just copy it and be fine. So I'll quickly finish this and present it as if it were the case. Of course, I'm not going to bother weaving in my ends just because I feel lazy today. Uh, but I will come back to you with what it would look like if I were using it. So it's not perfect, but it's a lot neater than what I had before. And boy, do I like it. Absolutely perfect. I can keep all of my stuff in here. I've got some additional stuff I can utilize back here. And it's far neater than what I had before. Far more transportable. As I said, not perfect. But I like it. So again, sorry it's, this is such a long video. Um, but hopefully you got some benefit from it. Really practical crochet project that you can do. You can make your own case. Now, to be honest, you could just buy a case online. It's not like they don't sell them. But there's something rewarding and nice about making your own crochet case. Plus, it helps you to practice several different techniques, learn some new ones, like how to do these loops. Uh, you might be able to use them for a future project somewhere. Who knows? Um, so yeah, this is how it's done. If you had some trouble with understanding anything from this video, just feel free to let me know in the comments. I'll try to help you because I may not have phrased everything perfectly in this video, probably skipped over some things I didn't realize. Um, or if you just have minor troubles, go back through, watch the video. Um, so yeah, this is how you make your own crochet hook slash tool uh, case in crochet. So for now, that will be all for this tutorial. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed this tutorial and want to learn more about crochet, be sure to hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you never miss another video. Don't forget to give this video a big thumbs up and also share this video with your friends and family or on social media. And feel free to leave a comment down below. If you have any questions or suggestions or any feedback, I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, catch you later.